I'm glad to be talking about this uh, topic also. Um, it's a topic of particular interest to me. It's kind of a combination of uh, biological control of insect pests and also the important role of native plants. And my title here is The Role of Native Plants in the Battle Between Good and Bad Bugs. So I'm going to start by talking about the good bugs that you might see in the landscape, um, or as they're probably more appropriately called, beneficial insects. And beneficial insects, of course, are in the broader category of natural enemies. Okay, so there are basically three categories of natural enemies of insect pests. And the first that I'll mention here are parasitoids. And parasitoids are organisms that spend a portion of their life cycle within their host. And as a result, they, um, they end up killing the host. So here we have an adult uh, female wasp that's laying an egg into this aphid. And the egg of that wasp will hatch and the wasp larva will consume the aphid from within. Um, and then it completes its development within the aphid. And then the new wasp, um, after it's finished its development, it chews a hole out of that dead aphid. That's what you're seeing here. So all of these here are aphids that have been parasitized by these wasps. The second category of natural enemies that attack insect pests are predators. This is a surfid fly larva. So this is basically a maggot that uh, crawls around on the plant and it devours these aphids. It can also consume other types of pests as well. Some other examples of predators are soldier beetles, uh, lacewing larvae. The, the adults of lacewings are not predators, but their larvae are very important predators. Um, there are a number of different true bugs. These are insects that are actually correctly called bugs. Um, for example, here's a predatory stink bug. And another example are lady beetles. This is the twice stabbed lady beetle. Um, there's the adult, and over here are a couple in the larval stage, and um, the, the rest of these are uh, in the pupal stage. The third category are pathogens. I won't cover these in this presentation, but I wanted to at least mention them. And these include uh, fungus, bacteria, nematodes, viruses, those sorts of things. Um, so those are also very important natural enemies of insect pests in the landscape. Here, this is actually, uh, this is an ant that's been consumed by this really bizarre looking fungus. So here, let me back up a minute though. Um, so there are many cases in the, in the landscape where natural enemies are playing a much bigger role than we really give them credit for. They're out there um, doing a lot of work that we don't often notice. And um, I think there are a lot of cases in which natural enemies probably deserve to be given a little um, more investigation to look at their, their potential of uh, what they can be doing for us. So one example I'd like to mention is the horned oak gall. Uh, these galls are produced on oak trees. Um, they're caused by a tiny wasp that lays its eggs in the twigs and leaves of these trees. And the tree then produces these terrible galls. And this is an increasing problem in Kentucky. Um, but the problem though is that they have a, a pretty complicated life cycle that makes treatment rather difficult. And despite efforts of uh, researchers to find effective control methods, um, they really haven't had much success in finding a control method that's really reliable. Um, but an interesting point here, though, is that Dan Potter at the university, along with one of his students several years ago, found that natural enemies often account for 70 to 80 percent mortality of the leaf galling stage. So again, these natural enemies are out there and they are working um, and it, they deserve to be given a little more attention, um, especially when we're not finding these other um, uh, control options. 
Another example are aphids. Aphids are a pretty common pest in the landscape. They have many <coughs> different types of natural enemies that are also fairly common in the landscape. And uh, with aphids, when there's this lag period between when the um, pest arrives at the plant until when the natural enemy finds that pest and attacks it, that lag period with aphids is relatively acceptable. Um, if you have a few aphids on your plant and you're not planning to sell that plant right away, those aphids aren't necessarily a, a major issue. Versus if you think about a borer that would bore into a tree, if, you, if your tree gets nailed by one borer, you basically, you can't sell that tree. So that lag period is a little more acceptable with um, pests like aphids. Another example are scales. Scales are pretty difficult to control with uh, chemicals, uh, especially with sprays. Uh, they've got this protective waxy covering on them that protects them from spray applications. They can also be extremely fecund. Um, depending on the species, an indiv one individual might produce three to 4,000 offspring. And the treatment timing is critical. If you're going to spray these pests, you have to treat them um, during the crawler stage when the immature are active um, and when they're most vulnerable. And this can be kind of difficult to, to get them at that period. But even if you are successful in getting them at that, at that point, um, the crawlers can settle in crevices or under dead adult scales. So that um, can also provide some protection from the sprays. So again, I wanted to comment that um, scales also have many natural enemies in the environment. So you might wonder though, um, so if natural enemies are so important and they um, play such an important role, then why do we still see all these outbreaks in, in the landscape? Um, in part, there are a number of factors involved, but one issue is that a lot of times these natural enemies don't have all the resources that they need to be successful. Um, and some examples of the resources that many natural enemies require are um, nectar from flowers that provides energy, um, pollen for protein, an additional protein source, that many require an alternative um, prey for food stability. For example, if you're targeting a specific pest that's only present for maybe a four to six week window, um, but maybe the, the natural enemies are around for three or four months, they need something else during those periods to sustain themselves. And uh, natural enemies also oftentimes need uh, protected microclimates for shelter. So one example here again is this, um, this surfid fly larva or hoverfly. Um, this is the adult fly um, and the larvae again will consume many types of insect pests and they devour aphids. It's been found that some species can consume as many as 860 aphids in a lifetime. And, um, but the point here is that the adults must have the floral resources. In order to have these larvae consuming the aphids, you have to have the adults, and to have the adults, you have to have some flowers around for them. And just to drive home this point, um, there have been many researchers that have um, demonstrated how important sugar resources are for many types of parasitoids. So, for example, in this study, they um, looked at one species of aphid parasitoid, and they fed it um, a sugar solution versus only feeding them water. And they found that with the sugar, they lived eight times longer versus water alone. Similarly, in another study with caterpillar parasitoids, they found that the parasitoids lived four to six times longer and produce 3.6 times more offspring. Again, another study, they produce two times more offspring. In another, uh, with another species, they lived 
23 to 26 days when provided with a sugar solution, but they're only t able to survive a couple days if they aren't provided that sugar. So it's very important. Um, and just one more example of a scale, scale parasitoid. They live 30 days when provided honey um, in the laboratory to feed upon, um, but no more than three days without that honey. So in addition to sugar sources, as I mentioned before, um, natural enemies often require alternative sources for prey. And so what some individuals are doing is they're turning to these banker plant systems. Basically what you have here is, in this example, you have a greenhouse where you're growing maybe vegetables or annuals or whatever. And let's say you've got a number of aphids that are continually a problem. So what they're doing is they bring in these banker plants that are some type of grass species. Lots of times they're rye or barley. Um, and then they intentionally infest these grass plants with aphids that will only feed on grass. So you have this grass plant with aphids, but those aphids will not jump onto your crop. And then, on top of that, um, they introduce a specific natural enemy into the system. And that those natural enemies will feed on the aphids on the crop, but when those populations get low, they can continue to survive on these aphids in the grass. And this has been pretty effective. Um, it's been shown to be a very effective um, system and they are targeting specific natural enemies and specific pests. So looking at the nursery setting, let's ask the question of what type of resources are available for natural enemies. In this picture here, there really aren't a lot of resources available. Um, and again, sometimes you have these monoculture settings where the natural enemies have no additional resources available for them. So there are, there is the idea of using these conservation strips. Um, there's actually an organic vegetable farm in Crestwood, Kentucky that has planted a conservation strip of uh, flowering plants. It's 400 feet long, 10 feet wide, it's next to their um, vegetable production fields. The purpose is to promote these beneficial insects. Um, this, is, this is not a photo of that um, particular farm, but this is just an example of what a conservation strip might look like. But these are also being used on golf courses and parks to preserve uh, natural enemies and pollinators. Um, there's actually a graduate student at UK, that uh, Jenny Condra, who just finished a project evaluating different uh, common flowering plants that support scolia wasps, which are um, parasitoids of the green june beetle. And green june beetle is a, a pest at golf courses and other turf settings. So the idea is to look for specific flowers that can be used on, in these landscapes to promote those beneficial insects. So um, this idea is termed conservation biological control where we're conserving and supporting the natural enemies that are already in the environment. And I just wanted to kind of quickly compare that approach to pesticide usage. And there are pros and cons of each approach, of course. With pesticides, uh, they can be rather expensive, especially um, when you consider the chemical itself as well as the labor involved. And if there are multiple applications that are, that are required, it can become expensive. Uh, conservation biological control is relatively inexpensive. Um, there can be the, the installation costs and the maintenance costs. So there are some costs involved, but it's a relatively inexpensive approach. Um, again, with pesticides, there may be multiple treatments required, um, and there's a lot of planning involved if you need to apply it during a precise time um, to when the pest is most vulnerable. 
Well, with the natural enemies, they figure that out for you. They know when the pest is vulnerable, um, and they are already adapted um, to know the timing. So it's a fairly self-sustaining system once it's established. Pesticides can pose a hazard to you and your employees and maybe even your customers, so that's always an issue, um, versus biological control is completely safe to you. Um, pesticides can lead to pest resistance, whereas pests will continue to remain susceptible to their natural enemies. Pesticides, however, are more predictable um, and they give more immediate effects. Um, and in some situations, that is the best approach. Um, biological control is a dynamic system. Um, there's a lag period involved that sometimes is not acceptable. Um, and, um, but the, the thing, though, is that with the biological control, the hope is that the natural enemies are out there continually working and kind of providing your security blanket and keeping those pest populations um, low. So both are not going to be particularly effective against certain pests. Again, um, we haven't found any chemical control options that work well with horned oak gall. And um, on the other hand though, with borers, we can't really rely on the natural enemies because one borer is too, too much for a tree.